And uh, I'm Dr. Juni Lin from Taipei, Taiwan. I'm currently the uh, Professor Emeritus of National Taiwan University College of Medicine and also the Chair Professor of Taipei Medical University. I'm currently working in the uh, Taipei University Shang Songho Hospital. I'm so much uh, um, happy to chair this section. And uh, today, uh, the initial uh, Open will be uh, should be uh, Dr. Jack Tan as the president of APSC. Uh, currently, he's uh, very much busy in his uh, afternoon break clinic. So I will take uh, the opportunity to, in to introduce the whole section. For this section, we are going to have uh, five speakers from Asian Pacific uh, Society Cardiology and also from Europe and. Uh, there will be a speaker from Korea, Professor Park, and also the uh, speaker from Germany, Professor Andreas Gotet, and so, so the speakers from Thailand, that's uh, Dr. Tajapong and Ngapo Mukos, and uh, also be uh, coming with the uh, Professor Aganori Ikeda from Japan, and also the, Dr. Professor Minjun She from Taiwan. And today the topic is going to talk about rhythm or rate control. As we all know that the rhythm control is currently uh, or rate control is currently a big part, is a very, very interesting topic in a few areas of physiology, but also in general cardiology. Everybody knows that they maintain the normal science is very good for the recovery or the maintenance of the normal cardiovascular function. However, the kinds of debate seems to be going on for decades. We don't know why, but the uh, study from the very beginning seems that the uh, maintaining science really is not really a good option because of the uh, old original drugs, they are not so good. But these years, because the, uh, well, the kind of uh, emergency of uh, modern the, uh, cancer very technique with all kinds of modalities, it seems it's improving. However, there are a lot of trials going on. It seems the answer is still not so clear. But uh, more and more evidence is coming. So we are thinking that maybe today we can come in out some kind of a consensus in 2021, hopefully. And so, so this uh, meeting uh, we will be uh, is housed by the uh, APC uh, crowd. And this uh, webinar is copyrighted by the APC and uh, should not be distributed without the prior permission of the APC. The views and opinions expressed in this webinar are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APC. And also for housekeeping, a live streaming content of this webinar will be made available via APC Crowd, APC Facebook, and also APC YouTube page. So we'll be starting from the first speaker. I'll introduce the first speaker. I will be Professor Hui Nam Park. Professor Hui Nam Park is currently a professor of medicine at the University of Seoul, Korea. He is also a director of Heart and Vascular Intervention Center, Severance Cardiovascular Hospital, Yonsei Hospital, Yonsei University Health System, Seoul, Korea. He is also currently a Secretary General of APAC, AB, Asian Pacific Harbor Society. So we'll start from Professor Park's talk. And the topic Professor Park is talking about is the reason or rate control strategy for normal VRH regulation therapy after Cabana and the arrhythmic operation for rate only. Professor Park, please. Thank you very much, Professor Lin, Professor Teo, and I appreciate the organic committee I'm very glad to be here. And uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can share it. You can. Uh, Is it full it screen? Oh, not yet. Sir. Oh, yeah. Now, now it's full screen. No problem. No problem. Okay. This is my disclosure information. Uh, let me start. I think the key question for this session might be, who is the best candidate for AF rhythm control? 
So we need to consider several factors to decide rhythm control of AF. And first, the A symptom. The symptom has been considered as an important determinant of AF rhythm control. However, 2020 ESC guidelines recommended a cardioversion try in patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic persistent AP patients to exclude unconscious other patients. Because atrial fibrillation is progressive disease, we can try rhythm control in relatively young patients with minimal symptom. And also AF duration and left atrial size may reflect the degree of atrial remodeling and uh, it is very important prognostic factor of AF rhythm control. We also need to consider the efficacy and safety of an anterosemic drug or catheter ablation. A recently published East AFNET 4 trial proved the superiority of early rhythm control strategy compared with symptom-based usual care. Uh, but the, I think the Professor Guete uh, will give us a lecture on this uh, topic in the le next lecture. So, I will skip this slide briefly. And uh, this is the main issue of my talk, Cabana trial. Doug Pecker uh, uh, and the Cabana investigators published this study in JAMA 2019. Cabana investigators compared the catheter ablation versus drug therapy in over 2,000 patients. In terms of uh, ITT analysis, Ablation tended to be better than drug therapy for the primary outcome, which included death, major stroke, major bleeding, and cardiac arrest. However, uh, it did not reach to the statistical differences. In contrast, catheter ablation was significantly better than medical therapy in terms of overall mortality or cardiovascular hospitalization. And this is superiority of catheter ablation was even more significant in the purple analysis and I will show this data later. Okay, what did the 2020 ESC guidelines say? Rhythm control recommended patient group might be the young patient and short history of AF, tachy-induced cardiomyopathy, normal sized LA, no comorbidity, rate control failure, or patient's preference. One thing I would like to emphasize in 2020 ESC guideline is, as I talked, uh, mentioned before, cardioversion trial is recommended even in symptom absent patient to exclude unconscious other patients. So after cardioversion trial, if the patient symptom is improved remarkably, then uh, we can recommend continuous rhythm control. And it is a major change compared with the previous guidelines. Guideline-based uh, anterosmic drug selection guarantees relatively safe drug therapy for rhythm control. And if AF record and the A anterosmic drug, rhythm control can be switched to catheter ablation, which is proven to be better than drug therapy. So I would like to list up the proofs for the clinical benefit of catheter ablation at this post Cabana era. This is per protocol analysis of Cabana trial. In the Cabana trial, actually 9% of patients in ablation group somehow withdraw from the ablation group after randomization. Also, ITT did not reach the statistical significant, although their purple analysis showed the significantly superiority of catheter ablation. If we consider 28% crossover from drug therapy group to catheter ablation group, it is quite an encouraging outcome. As we expected, the rhythm outcome was significantly better than catheter ablation group than in drug therapy group. AF ablation is proven to reduce heart failure mortality. Morushi reported the beneficial effect of catheter ablation in patients with severe heart failure, is action fraction less than 35%, and uh, ICD backed up uh, patients. In this Castle AF trial, proved the AF reduced mortality of heart failure hospitalization rate significantly. Ablation also improves uh, uh, heart failure with preserved action fraction. My junior colleague Kim Min compared the HEPEP score, which is the objective scoring system for heart failure uh, with a preserved dissection fraction before and year after ablation. In AF patient with underlying high HEPEP score, well, which means the underlying HEPEP, the proportion of patients with improved HEPEP score was significantly higher than those with low score. However, in patient with AF recurrence and sustaining AF, the proportion of patients with worsening HEPEP score was significantly higher. Vice versa, 
the rhythm outcome was worse in patients with worsened HEPAP score a year after the ablation. What about the role of ablation in terms of stroke prevention? In this study, Kim Min also compared over 1,600 patients who underwent ablation with over 92,000 medical therapy group or non-AA population. And during five years of follow-up period, the risk of ischemic stroke was significantly lower in ablation group than in medical therapy group. And the degree of risk reduction was comparable with the non-AA population. Another interesting find of this study was ablation also reduced the risk of intracranial hemorrhage significantly compared with medical therapy. Therefore, AF rhythm control not only controls AF symptom, but also reduces the risk of stroke and ICH. Kim Deun uh, analyzed the risk of dementia in AF patient with uh, the catheter ablation versus medical therapy group among national health insurance uh, entire court data. And ablation showed a significantly low risk of dementia regardless of associated, associated stroke. So both NOAA and the catheter ablation significantly reduced the risk of dementia. We recently published that catheter ablation also improved the cognitive function one year after the procedure. In contrast to the reduced cognitive function in medical therapy group, uh, MOCA cognitive score improved in AF catheter ablation group. However, this positive effect of ablation was not observed in patients who recurred as sustaining atrial fibrillation after catheter ablation. Finally, eh, Park Jae-ho compared the five-year change of renal function, comparing over 500 patients who underwent ablation versus over 1,700 patients under medical therapy. And five-year EGFR was significantly improved in ablation group, but there was no significant change in medical therapy. So we assume that the improved cardiac output, output after catheter ablation results in positive effects on both uh, renal and cognitive functions. Then, who is the appropriate candidate for catheter ablation? We know that the ablation at the earlier stage of AF is better for long-term rhythm outcome. Then how well is good enough? Based on the AF duration counted by first ECG documentation, the longer AF duration did not affect the rhythm outcome of paroxysmal AFib patient catheter ablation. However, in patient with long-standing persistent AFib, uh, AF lasting over three years showed significantly worse rhythm outcome than those lasted a shorter period. Recently, we proved that uh, there is a sex difference in the outcome of catheter ablation after propensity score matching. The rhythm outcome of ablation was worse in women than in men in both de novo and uh, repeat ablation procedures. Although PV reconnection rate was significantly lower in women, extra PV trigger was more commonly found in female patients and it plays an important role as AF recurrence. The existence of metabolic syndrome, obesity, and high pericardial fat volume was also significantly associated with poorer rhythm outcome of AF. Different from the Western country data, the proportion of obesity and BMI over 30 was only 5% in our cohort. And the actual difference of rhythm outcome began to appear two years after the uh, procedure. So this is uh, the separating point, two years. So which means AF progression might be the main mechanism of their AF recurrence in those patients with metabolic factor. We also found that long PR interval is a predisposing factor for atrial remodeling and poor rhythm outcome, and high left atrial pressure and pulse pressure were also important poor progress factor for uh, AF ablation. Then, which patient group has a higher risk of complication? Two titrate RF energy delivery depending on atrial wall thickness we developed a customized software and validated, validated it. And we can generate a left atrial wall thickness map by utilizing Laplace equation and oil method from cardiac CT imaging. And then we measure the left atrial wall thickness in, in over 1,800 patients with retrospective data. In this study, the risk of major complication and the cardiac tamponade were significantly higher in elderly female patients. 
and uh, those are over 75 years old, female patients show a higher complication risk. And uh, these older ladies and left hip and right side, the PV atrial wall thickness were significantly thinner than other groups. So thin atrial wall is related to the higher complication rate in elderly uh, ladies during uh, AF cat population. Also, we believe malnutrition is extremely rare in developed countries. It is relatively uh, commonly seen in elderly patients uh, and known to be associated with increased mortality. Actually, we calculated the malnutrition corner score in over 3,000 patients who underwent ablation, and 30% showed a mild degree of malnutrition, and 0.4% had moderate to severe degree of malnutrition in this patient group. And the complication rate of ablation was significantly higher with increased corner score. However, there was no difference in the long-term rhythm outcome of cat ablation, depending on malnutrition score. Park Jeo compared the lactator pressure at de novo and repeat ablation cases in 142 patients and found ablation itself increased the lactator pressure significantly. However, symptom score did not uh, differ in this quarter study. And one thing we need to keep in mind was the increase of LA stiffness and LA pressure was more significant in patients who underwent extra empirical extra PVLA ablation. So empirical extra PVLA ablation does not improve rhythm outcome, but rather increase the lactator pressure. So we believe more touchy, more scar. Okay, based on these previous studies, I would like to summarize a good candidate for AF ablation. The patient with paroxysmal AFib and persistent AFib lasting shorter than three years might have acceptable rhythm outcome. Male uh, is better than female in terms of rhythm outcome. No more PL interval in the ECG, no metabolic syndrome, or low LA pressure is, are good candidate factors. In contrast, we need uh, to take care of the risk of complication in elderly women over 75 years with thin atrial wall or malnutrition patients. However, uh, atrial fibrillation ablation still has many limitations to overcome. This is compromise curve for AF recurrence after ablation in my institute. In over 4,200 patients experienced, one year outcome is pretty good, over 80 to 87% success. However, as the patient gets older, AF recurrence continuously like this. I think the first AF recurrence five years after the novel procedure might be AF progression. Although we can manage AF somewhat by ablation, it is not a curable disease at all. And this is first hurdle we need to overcome. Yeah, that is limitation of a current, uh, the current technology to achieve long lasting PV isolation. However, I think this issue will be solved very rapidly developing potentially very powerful technologies for efficient PBIs. Currently high parachute duration RF and cryoablation become, became very popular in daily practice in Korea. However, data from their long-term outcome are limited. Therefore, we compare the 60 watt high parachute duration with conventional 35 watt RF population after propensity score matching in this retrospective study. As you know, high parachute duration ablation generates a shallow but contiguous RF lesion very efficiently. And it is suitable for AF population because atrial wall thickness is at most four millimeters. In this retrospective study, uh, including over 1,200 patients, there was no significant difference in rhythm outcome between high parachute duration versus conventional RF populations. However, the procedure time <clears throat> and ablation time were significantly reduced by this high parachute duration ablation. This is very recently conducted RCT comparing high parachute duration RF versus Cryo PBI in 310 patients in with paroxysmal AFib. Uh, we know the fire and ice trial compared the cryo versus RF in paroxysmal AFib. There was no uh, study. There was a no study comparing the cryo versus high parachute duration RF. And this is RCT randomized clinical trial. And baseline characteristics were well matched, and the procedural time was significantly shorter in cryo group. 
even though high procedure duration uh, reduced the procedure time significantly than conventional RF, but prior is uh, resulted in even shorter uh, procedure time than high procedure duration. And we did the additional RF touch up in 7% of prior and 8% uh, of uh, high procedure duration group uh, conducted uh, extra PV trigger ablation. Although there was no significant difference in major complication risk, we experienced three cases of right side fragment of paralysis. And this is the outcome of craft trial. After uh, mean 10 months follow period, there was no significant difference in rhythm outcome in spite of extra PV trigger ablation in high pressure duration group. So this manuscript is currently submitted. Okay, this is the second hurdle we have to overcome. Not only a long lasting PBI, but also extra PV triggers are the main mechanism of AF frequency ablation. This study included over 2,300 patients who underwent isoprotonal provocation at the end of the procedure, and the existence of extra PV foci was consistently associated with poor rhythm outcome, regardless of a de novo procedure or repeat procedures. And as the number of extra PB trigger increases, the rhythm outcome became even worse in this study. However, there is no clear solution to control these extra PB trigger, especially in patients with persistent AFib. As you know, these RCTs fail to prove the role of empirical extra PB ablations, including linear extra, uh, electron guided ablation, firm ablation, and complete electric isolation of posterior wall. In contrast, about 40% recurrence rate within a year may not be enough after this invasive procedure. We previously compared the isoprotonal provocation and trigger ablation versus just finishing the case without provocation during a AF ablation procedure. It is possible to uncover extra PV trigger site by quick 3D map nowadays. Isoprovocation and trigger ablation improved the rhythm outcome uh, in this retrospective study. However, the rhythm outcome was still very worse with extra PV trigger in spite of additional ablation than those without triggers. Professor Young Kim's group also conducted the RCT with a similar design and proved the usefulness of isoprotonal provocation and non pb 4 side ablation. But as you saw in the CRAFT trial, I, as I show in the uh, comparing the prior versus high pressure duration, current mapping and ablation technology have a lot of limitations to eliminate the extra PV triggers. I believe computational modeling, uh, well, computational modeling will provide the solution. Uh, we are studying AF computational modeling integrated patients' cardiac CT image, electroanatomical map, and after reflecting anatomy, fibrosis, and fiber orientation, we trace uh, extra PB uh, drivers uh, such as dominant frequency and phase singularity. And uh, after reporting the positive outcome of QBIAF1, we are currently conducting uh, two more RCTs uh, using the computation models. Okay, this is my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. The symptom is not an absolute criteria for the rhythm or rate control anymore and the rate control can be considered in asymptomatic elderly patients over 75 years with a big LA size. Poor rhythm outcome of ablation in AF lasting over three years, women, obesity, longer PR interval, higher precardial fat volume, and associated with extra PV triggers. Innovative technologies may further improve the outcome of ablation by generating long lasting PBI and eliminating the extra PV triggers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to uh, Professor Park's uh, very interesting talk. And uh, it's uh, very interesting that the, uh, Dr. Park has been uh, talking very much about the uh, cast average in effect. And uh, it seems uh, there is still some uh, reason it's difficult to be conquered by average alone. So, okay, then we'll move on to the next speaker. And uh, we will have a Q&A after the first speaker together. And uh, I will introduce the second speaker. And uh, 
The second speaker will be Professor Andreas Ete. And uh, Professor Andreas Ete is currently the uh, professor and also chief physician of cardiology intensive care unit, intensive care medicine of St. Vincent's Hospital, Halepo, Germany. He is also currently the uh, faculty member of the European HRA. And also he is, uh, he is uh, exactly the board director of the h 5 net AVNET trial. And the AVNET trial is responsible for the recent published East AVNET 4. So we'll welcome uh, Professor Andreas Ete for the talk. Professor Andreas Ete, please. Yes, uh, dear chairman, um, Thank you for the very kind introduction and uh, welcome to everybody in uh, Taiwan, Singapore. And um, it's my pleasure and privilege to give this talk about uh, the East AFNET 4 trial, which uh, we published last year during the ESC in the hotline session. And the trial was conducted by AFNET and I was a sponsor representative for this trial and Paulus Kirchhoff was the first author on this and I think um, it's really worth to discuss uh, the results of this uh, of this trial. So uh, these are my disclosures. So why do we have to, or why did we have to conduct the early rhythm control therapy in NA and patient with atrial fibrillation trial? It's because 2002 we were quite astonished by the results of the Affirm trial. And just to remind you, this trial was a strategy driven trial to compare rhythm control to rate control. And of course, in these days, we had the idea that if we could stop AF, we could also terminate anticoagulation. So, and the outcome was really the opposite what was expected that actually rate control was doing a bit better than rhythm control. Despite all the aspects we already started to learn about atrial remodeling and atrial fibrillation begets AF and so on, the results were the opposite. And of course, we learned that termination of oral anticoagulation was one of the main factors really driving the results. However, sub-studies from a firm clearly showed us that sinus rhythm is a good thing to have. So outcome was better if someone was in sinus rhythm. However, the classical use of antirhythmic drug was associated with impaired outcome. So this was uh, the outcome or the basis when we started the East AFNET 4 trial. And I would like to share with you the original data and uh, then to give some pathophysiological explanation what we think could at least be involved to explain results of the East AFNET 4 trial. So, the question was, does early rhythm control therapy improve outcome compared to usual care in patients with early recently diagnosed atrial fibrillation at risk of stroke? And we conducted a multi-center uh, trial, which was uh, supported by official bodies in Germany as well as uh, by industry. And so what we try to do is to randomize patients and everybody had a chest vest score of two or above and AF duration of less than one year to early rhythm control and usual care. Importantly, all the treatment encompassed oral anticoagulation if needed. So, and then in early rhythm control, all means available could be used to restore sinus rhythm and keep the patient in sinus rhythm versus conventional care driven by symptoms of the patient to start with rate control as, all, as also suggested by the guidelines. And then uh, in accordance to um, symptoms, you could also of course increase the intensity of your therapy in that group as well. And then the trial was an outcome driven trial. So actually we had a very long follow up to observe outcome parameters in these uh, patients. So the primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, worsening of heart failure or acute coronary syndrome, and also nights spent in hospital per year. And we tried to observe a 20% reduction in the first primary outcome um, to be a clinical 
relevant. And uh, we estimated the power, of course, in accordance to these assumptions. So initially, it was planned to have 2,810 patients um, in the trial. So we randomized 2,789 patients, less than expected, in 135 uh, sites in 11 countries. And we randomized 1,395 patients to the early rhythm control arm and 1,394 to the usual care arm. Actually, the number was lower than expected because the trial was terminated early. So initially, and this is at baseline, all available means were used. So the majority of patients as an initial strategy received, and this is important, antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Just 8% received catheter ablation immediately after randomization. And at two years follow-up, still the majority of patients were on antiarrhythmic drugs and catheter ablation was used in about 20%. So this strategy encompassing antiarrhythmic drug therapy as well as catheter ablation was definitely different to the usual care arm where 96% of the patients initially received rate control only and even after two years, 85% still received rate control. So rhythm control in the early rhythm control arm and rate control in the usual care arm. And almost everybody received oral anticoagulation. I think this is the baseline of our uh, trial. So these are the patient demographics. So the mean age was 70 as expected. Chet's vest was 3.3 or 3.4. So importantly, 38% of the patients included in the trial had the very first documented AF episode. This I think is important. And 30% of the included patients had no symptoms. So as, as you have already heard in the previous talk, there are indeed until now differences with therapy regarding to symptoms. However, in, early, in East, we had early episodes, the first one, as well as asymptomatic episodes. And of course, 92% of all patients received oral anticoagulation, which is uh, substantially high. So what is the outcome? The outcome is that in the eight year follow up period, the primary endpoint was substantially less in the rhythm control arm compared to the conventional treatment arm, which was still actually supported by the guidelines. So I think this is a very important finding because really it changes the view on the way you should treat patients with atrial fibrillation, even after the first episode, or even if they are asymptomatic, if you consider, of course, an adequate oral anticoagulation. So this, I think, is important. So if we take a big deeper look into the outcome parameters, you could see that cardiovascular death is reduced and the number of stroke. So besides the presence of an oral anticoagulant being in sinus rhythm or having this early rhythm control strategy further reduces the risk of stroke, numerically also worsening of heart failure and numerically without statistical significance, the number of acute coronary syndrome. So I think this is very important. And if you look in different uh, subgroups and all the results are of course published in the New England Journal, you do not see any subgroup which is obviously different in comparison to the main outcome. So this I think is important that the main message is correct for all the different subgroups also in patients with and without reduced ejection fraction, for example, and so forth. So I think this is important. So um, outcome, uh, safety outcome parameters are shown here. So there was no safety issue that early rhythm control is doing harmful events. And this I think is important because this is also the opposite of what we have seen in the firm. However, this outcome driven trial, I think uh, is very important really to also to say that even including antirhythmic drugs, it's not doing harm to the patients if the drugs are correctly um, applied to the patient. So this I think is of course important. 
Um, so the conclusion is that early initiation of rhythm control therapy reduces cardiovascular out outcome with early AF in cardiovascular conditions. Uh, this, I think, is important. However, the overall number of nights spent in the hospital were not reduced, which, of course, is explainable by the fact that, of course, rhythm control, uh, rhythm control requires hospital hospitalization due to cardioversions, etc. So, however, I think that overall, without seeing any safety issues, this, I think, is very important news for the whole EP community and all physicians dealing with patients with atrial fibrillation. So the question now is how can it be explained? What is the pathophysiological explanation for East AFNet for to say, well, besides oral anticoagulation, we still see differences. And of course we do know for many years and we have put a lot of effort in all the research that we know AF begets AF. However, we also have published many trials and all over the world there are many trials showing that atrial fibrillation also induces dysfunction of the left ventricle and changes in the left ventricle. So the question is, is this probably an explanation for the findings? And interestingly, of course, we have also seen that there are drugs like dronadarone, which are associated in contrast to sotalol, which is now a bit downgraded in the guidelines, or amiodarone with better outcome in comparison to the old class three antirhythmic drugs. So is this probably one explanation? And interestingly, the question is how can dronadarone, for example, which was also used in the East AFNet4 trial in, in patients, um, does this have an effect on cardiovascular function? And um, there are very nice animal data suggesting that dronadarone is a very potent dilator of the microcirculatory system in the left ventricle. And this is not the case in induced atrial fibrillation if you apply amiodarone, so forth to speak. So for that reason, of course, there's a reason probably to use, like suggested in the guidelines, dronadarone, especially in patients with coronary artery disease, because um, it can prevent oxidative stress to occur. And there is also a huge database analysis encompassing more than 50,000 patients in Germany, which we performed, where you could see that in dronadarone treated patients, for example, the number of myocardial infarction is reduced in comparison to other antirhythmic drug treatments or and the number of stroke is reduced because also dronadarone has been shown to reduce microcirculatory flow abnormalities in the brain, and especially if stroke occurs, for example, also the lesions are much smaller. So there are drug effects, of course. Um, we have heard already that Castle AF, and, and we will hear it later on again, has uh, shown that AF ablation interferes also with heart failure. And so to speak, of course, we had patients with reduced ejection fractions in East as well. So catheter ablation, of course, could have, and we are in the process to analyze this, could have interfered with progression of heart failure. And for that reason, of course, cardiovascular death was also reduced. So the effect of catheter ablation in comparison to conventional therapy might have also a substantial impact on the results of East. However, we still have to analyze those. And of course, um, the early on treatment is also supported now by other trials, by other trials, for example, like early cryo as initial therapy, which also showed that a very aggressive strategy to ablate very early on and to get rid of atrial fibrillation reduces a better outcome, probably. So I think taken together, we can say that the strategy used in EAST to be very aggressive very early on, to prevent atrial remodeling to occur, to prevent interference with ventricular function to occur, and also to interfere probably with decline in kidney function, to interfere with neurohormones, uh, could make a substantial difference to explain the results. And therefore, we think, of course, that the East AFNet4 trial will definitely have an impact on further and future guidelines and clinical practice. However, we have to see what to do and what to use for sub-identification of groups within the AF cohort 
And right now we are using um, a new consortium in Europe to examine artificial intelligence uh, algorithms, for example, to really try to see how to define uh, the therapy even better in different subgroups. So EAST, I think, is important, and I hope for a fruitful discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you for Professor Edith's uh, interesting talk. And uh, as we know from the first two speakers, we learned uh, from Dr. Park that the uh, CAS operation is bringing more in science reason. And uh, also that the, uh, by, from Professor Edith's talk, we noticed that the risk drop is bringing more in science reason. Comparing the two talk, I can feel that it seems that the, uh, um, the scale of the uh, clinical trial, of course, as rock trial is much larger than cancer operation trials. And uh, it seems that the uh, maintenance sensor is still the main topic everybody focuses on. But I can see that it seems the difference is there. It seems that the uh, cancer operation study According to the Cabana trial, it seems that the, the heart endpoint in clinical cardiovascular deaths, heart failure hospitalization, or all the total mortality, it seems it's not too much improved comparing a cancer and versus drugs. And uh, from the East Ave study, it seems that the, the drug caused some uh, cancer abrasion if they came better control is in science reason, it seems it could change the, the uh, heart outpoint, heart endpoint, uh, according to the trials. I don't know how the, uh, uh, how do everyone uh, think about it? Is, uh, is it that the, uh, is, how do you, how does the pack think? Do you think that the uh, cast operation alone is enough to maintain science reason? Do you want to think about, you consider about anionic drugs? And uh, on the other hand, um, Dr. Edith, over the Edith, what kinds of pain do you think that the uh, cancer may be still quite as important as anionic drug in maintaining science reason? So, well, uh, um... If, oh, if, uh, if I may, um, uh, I think we, we have to understand that in many, many patients around the world, it's not that you have catheter ablation only or antirhythmic drug only. And I think, therefore, the concept of EAST is very striking because we can now show having heart endpoints like mortality and stroke, etc., that if you take everything together, and this was also used in the patients in East. So if you use antirhythmic drugs, if you use um, catheter ablation, if you combine all these approaches, then you get the benefit in addition to adequate oral anticoagulation. So it's not that we um, want to start the discussion about, is it really better to do catheter ablation instead of drugs? It's really to keep the patient in sinus rhythm. And I think this is the goal that uh, sinus rhythm per se is good for the patient and you should take all means which are available in your institutions, in your countries, really to keep the patient in sinus rhythm. And that is really supported uh, with the main results of EAST, that really rhythm control strategy, including everything, is better instead of just doing rate control and wait and see. And, and this, I think, is important. Of course, we will do sub-studies to see if there is still a difference between catheter ablation and antirhythmic drug and, and so on. But I think for the general cardiologist, I think it's very reassuring that it's not harmful to initiate drug therapy. However, if the patient of course has recurrences, he should proceed to catheter ablation and all this. And, um, but I think in contrast to a firm where actually all antirhythmic drugs were abundant because they are harmful, that we can now say with our study, this appears to be not the case. 
So I think for the whole community, and we, of course, we do have many cardiologists or cardiology centers which still do not do catheter ablation of AF, but they can still adequately start AF therapy. And I think this is a very important, a very important message, of course. I also fully agree with uh, Professor Goethe's opinion. The rhythm control itself, it is very important. So some people try to compare the uh, catheter ablation versus antiosmic drug, but uh, I think the uh, drug and catheter ablation is uh, mutually supportive. As you know, the catheter ablation is not perfect. There is this uh, continuous recurrence rate, and especially in patients with uh, the remarkable remodeling and also the female patient with extra PV triggers, probably the some some people is more beneficial by anterosmic, additional anterosmic drug rather than a repeat, repeat, triple and quadruple you know, catheter ablation. Also, the in the from the uh, data stage, the, we don't know uh, exactly which drug is more the dangerous, which drug is, what is the proper indication for each drug, but the, our experience for anterosmic drug is uh, increased and uh, uh, guideline-based anterosmic drug uh, therapies uh, became relatively the safer, uh, even though the SOTAL uh, uh, downgraded to the class 2B indication nowadays. So I think the catatablation and anterosmic drug uh, should be uh, mixed uh, strategy for the better rhythm control. Also, one thing I would like to the, <clears throat> and, uh, point out is if there is two randomized clinical trial, positive randomized, cl randomized clinical trial, we can put uh, those strategy and the class one indication of guidelines. But uh, there are so many uh, uh, randomized clinical trials comparing the catheter ablation versus the drug therapy, but still it is the primary catheter ablation is not in class one indication. There might be the support the my hypothesis or the Professor Guete's opinion. Can I comment and ask some questions? Um, first to Gotta Andreas, uh, your is study, how many percent of the patients were actually atrial fibrillation, catheter ablation, and how many percent were drugs? Um, so initially in the early rhythm control arm um, at bay or right after randomization, about 8% received right away catheter ablation. And after two years, 20%. So initially the, the drug therapy was about in, in 70%. And then at follow-up, it was about a bit more than 60%. So the majority of patients were still on drugs and just 20% um, uh, after two years, at least, uh, had received catheter ablation. So it's, it's really a predominantly a drug therapeutic uh, effect. So I think this is important because otherwise a lot of people were, like you say, thinking that drugs are poisonous and there's no point giving rhythm control. And perhaps when, I'm sure you're going to do a sub-study where you look at your antiarrhythmic drugs, although they may dilute your volume, to show at least there's some safety in the use of antiarrhythmic drugs and not yes. just everybody needs anti, uh, AF ablation. The second yes. question is, of course, you know, the early study suggests that the earlier we get to them, but does this apply to someone who does get atrial fibrillation, but is very elderly, you know, has uh, severe cardiomyopathy? Uh, would this hypothesis still hold in someone who presents AF late, but already have got bad atrial cardiomyopathy? <laughs> As always, a very tricky and intelligent question, of course. Well, at least from the EAST trial, we have not looked in, well, we, we looked in subgroups of, of certain age patients, so to have younger ones and, and elderly ones, and uh, the overall results were the same. Of course, you could always argue if someone develops the very first episode at an age of 85 or so to speak, if it's really if it's really possible to improve overall mortality in a group at an age of 85 or above, probably not. It's, it's probably about just quality of life. I think in, in most geriatric type patients, it's really about quality of life and not about life uh, expectancy. Um, so for that reason, of course, um, like 
we have to judge um, on, a, on an individual basis. And in some of these patients, it, it might be just better to have, I don't know, like his bundle ablation and pacing or whatever, just to keep the patient uh, without symptoms and uh, out of the hospital. But uh, at this point, we cannot really answer this from the EAST trial, but I'm definitely sure that there is an age cutoff where you don't see changes in, in mortality because just the overall background mortality is so high because at the very end, we all are going to die. So <laughs> point, uh, there is death, the final answer. Um, no, but, um, and the opposite is also true for the very young ones. Yes. Uh, we have to keep in mind that we included patients with a chats vest of two or above. So, and one of the factors of course was age. So if the results, probably they are true, but we do not know if someone comes in at an age of 40 without any concomitant disease, uh, then this was not studied, this type of patient. So of course, for the very old ones, um, we, we have to examine this and patients with a chats vest of zero because all these patients were not studied in the nice. East AFD. For Dr. Park, although you made the point about three, three years uh, uh, or more, you know, occasionally I'm sure you've seen patients so-called come to see you for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and they claim there's only one year. But when, when you go in and do the ablation, you'll see there's hardly any voltage. Everything is red in color, voltage very low. Would you still say that uh, sometimes you get these type of patients, isn't it? The limitation of that study is uh, we don't know the more than 40% of patients is asymptomatic. So it is very difficult to know the how, how is the duration, real duration of atrial fibrillation. So we cut up the, the AF onset uh, based on ECG documentation. So that is a limitation of a study. So we need to careful to interpret that study. Yes. In terms of the uh, rhythm control in the minimally symptomatic patients, I do in uh, younger patient, at least younger than 65, yes. because the AF is progressive disease. But the if patient is uh, over 75 and uh, asymptomatic, I don't touch those patients for yeah. rhythm control. Well, Andres is an expert at atrial cardiomyopathy. You think everybody with atrial fibrillation will eventually get atrial cardiomyopathy? And perhaps atrial fibrillation ablation just delays the onset or can we really prevent atrial cardiomyopathy with ablation alone? Um, well, I think this is um, difficult to answer. I think in the long run, um, I assume that of course, many patients or probably everybody will develop atrial cardiomyopathy and probably the basis for atrial fibrillation in many patients is the already established atrial cardiomyopathy before they start to have atrial fibrillation. Uh, so I think this is, um, Definitely true from all the studies we do have um, at this point, it's very hard to have a certain tool like imaging technology to stratify the cardiomyopathy, but usually the patients have damaged atrial tissue. If catheter ablation can cure cardiomyopathy, I definitely would doubt this, like with all the other means, because um, you have seen the beautiful data in the previous talk that catheter ablation increases left atrial pressure, of course, because we are damaging the tissue and uh, we are uh, doing some harmful aspects, although we get rid of atrial fibrillation. However, we definitely harm uh, the atrial tissue because we are destroying parts of the atrial. And for that reason, of course, we do know that there is a stiff left atrial syndrome after extensive catheter ablation on the left side with pulmonary hypertension, et cetera. So we have to balance this. And there are also very interesting studies that after extensive lesions in the left atrium, if you in have an increase in pressure, a substantial increase, that this is the best predictor for the recurrence of AF. So I think there is a threshold where if you cross this threshold that actually atrial fibrillation ablation is doing harmful events in the atrium, driving atrial cardiomyopathy and inducing further AF recurrences. So that at this point, it's, it's not clear how we define the threshold, but I'm pretty sure that something like this exists. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, it's about a time. And uh, 
I think uh, Dr. Park and uh, Dr. Gode would like to keep staying, and uh, we will. There will be more discussion. I think after the last three speakers, and uh, there, I think uh, there is uh, a lot of interesting things that is to be going on. I think it's going on, on, on. and uh, I will transfer my championship. Uh, so Dr. Teo and uh, Dr. Teo, please. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Tachapong Nangamoros uh, Tachapong, who is well known to most of you. He is the president of uh, APHRS currently, and he's going to talk about the rhythm or rate control for rheumatic uh, valvular atrial fibrillation, antiarrhythmic drugs uh, ablation or rate control. Tachapong, please. Thank you, Professor Tio. Thank you, Professor Lin, for inviting uh, me to give this talk today. Let me see, I have to share my screen, start the broadcast, and then switch to the slide over here. Okay, I hope everyone can see me now. Um, so this is a topic I got, and I was quite, quite stunned when I saw the topic, rate and rhythm control in rheumatic and non-rheumatic valvular heart disease. As you can see on, I think on your left side of the screen, that's the type of rheumatic heart disease we see in Thailand. As you can see, if you can see it so well, this uh, post mitral valve, it's a ball cage type and the heart is that big. So I'm gonna invite everyone who wants to do ablation on this patient uh, to go ahead, but I'm not. So I'm just gonna cut down to just rate control and rhythm control in rheumatic heart disease who their heart is probably on the smaller size. Now, these are my disclosure. Let's skip that. Um, so we'll talk about the rheumatic uh, valvular heart disease and AFib a little bit, pathology and things like that. We talked a little bit about rate control and then see what data we have on trying to do rate a uh, rhythm control for these group of patients. Now, remember for the last two talks, everyone been hearing about non-valvular heart disease. So, so now looking at people who have rheumatic heart. AF are presented in like one third of the patients. Um, you know, the funny part is that actually in Europe, as compared to Africa, in Europe, they actually have more AFib in patients with rheumatic heart disease. And it's all like that. In, even in non-endemic areas tend to have more AFib now, whether that's under diagnosis or, or under reporting, uh, not so clear in the report. Now, data from India showing that um, about half of the patient who has a fitna. So this is a group of AF patient in India, which are quite young, they're only 50 years old on average, and half of them were started with uh, rheumatic heart disease. So don't be surprised that the next few slides are being shown from India. Now, these are data from England. Uh, you could see here that, you know, the majority of mortality, stroke, emboli are related to micro stenosis and aortic stenosis. The other while, the regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, uh, look like they are on a higher side of risk, but but um, not as bad. Prosthetic while, it, anything, any while actually increase the risk. Now look at the patho and pathophysiology a little bit now. You can see on this slide by uh, DiMarco, um, you know, any heart valve problems you have, you end up with increased atrial pressure, progressive atrial dilatation, and then certainly atrial remodeling, atrial fibrosis, and el electrophysiology remodeling. And everyone has atrial uh, myopathy and then end up with atrial fibrillation. Now, now in pathology, the two things that quite happen uh, in people with rheumatic heart is fibrosis. On top of that, you get inflammation and these neoangiogenesis, all these new blood vessels bring in all these cells that cause inflammation and damaging the heart valve. So, you know, so the AF as the heart gets bigger, there's more AFib. If there's more calcification, there's more AFib. And now keep in mind that even after doing a balloon valvuloplasty or valve repair or replacement, these fibrosis doesn't go away. Now, 
interesting thing is that lossing sinus rhythm in patient with mitral stenosis doesn't really decrease the output of the heart too much because it's already down from the wow. The, the faster the rate actually has more effects than losing the atrial contraction in these group of patients. Now, this is just to show that in patients who have a fib in rheumatic heart with a fib, there tends to be like worse patients have been having more symptoms, have been having uh, symptoms for longer. The wild scores are bad, you know, with additional mitral regurgitation, the age of size. So it does that mean that people who have AFib with rheumatic heart tend to have more extensive rheumatic heart disease. So now, as far as the rate control is concerned, basically they not much difference between people who have valvular heart disease and non-valvular heart disease. You know, it's always a background therapy. Uh, usually it's a first choice when you see patients uh, with rheumatic heart and AF. What's coming next, I'll show you later. And then, um, you know, if you fail rhythm control, then you always come back uh, to rate control. Or when you see something doing ablation or doing some other procedure will be too risky for the patient and leave them in AFib. Now, again, Similarly, there's nothing much difference for patient with rheumatic heart for rate control. Choice of medications, basic treatment are about the same. Now, for rhythm control, for rhythm control, um, the, the patient who have rheumatic heart, you have seen this uh, slide when uh, Dr. Pop showed you before. You can see that there's a factor that are not figuring controlling the rhythm in these group of patients. Doesn't mean that we're not gonna do it, but having a heart disease is not a favoring factor of having a good rhythm control, good result of rhythm control. Doesn't mean you're not gonna do it. Now, again, if you look at patient with valvular heart disease, it could fall into any of these categories. It could still be pyroxysmal AFib, or you could have become the persistent AFib, with a major risk factor for recurrent of having a heart problems, or you could have heart failure in some case reduce EF. Now, certainly by the guidelines, you go, uh, it's a patient choice, whether it's gonna be antiarrhythmics or catheter ablation, I guess depends on what you want to do. You kind of convince the patient to go along with uh, your preference. Now, certainly treating the underlying um, rheumatic condition is the way to go. As you can see, this one is mitral regurgitation. You have AFib, if you have AFib, it's an indication to do some intervention uh, for the heart. Now, this one is mitral stenosis. Only in the American side that they recommend that once you have atrial fibrillation is an indication to spring. Uh, Looking at uh, this one, Tucker reported in patient who, who underwent uh, valvuloplasty with AFib, you know, the, the results are similar. So whether you have AFib or don't have AFib, the result of doing microvalvuloplasty and in the end survival rate are similar in the two groups. Uh, Leon has a little different result in these uh, group of patients. So the people who were having AFib, as far as survival concern, are not as good as those who doesn't have AFib. The result of the valvuloplasty are as good, but just overall mortality rate long-term are not as good. Now, this one is uh, by Dr. Fan and uh, Professor Lau. Um, how do you write the patient who were going for, who had uh, balloon valvuloplasty? You can see that the, the induction, the inducibility, the variability of AF kind of gets better when you decrease the pressure in the atrium. And the, the circle down below, that's the conduction delay in the atrium also doesn't get better in the group with AFib. While in people with sinus rhythm, once you release the pressure in the atrium, the conduction uh, delay, improves. Now, what are the things we can use? Certainly we've been talking about antiarrhythmic drugs a little bit. Uh, 
on the Easter study. So again, if you look at the guidelines, the latest ESC guidelines, uh, people with valvular heart disease, you could either do catheter ablation, you could do amiodarone, uh, donetarone, and the soda lava, which has been downgraded. Looking back a little bit on the older papers, you will still see that on the valvular heart disease side, depends on how thick in your heart. So if the heart is thick or the function of the heart is not good, the LV systolic function is not good. Um, so amiodarone, but otherwise, you could use flecainide propafenone too in people who still doesn't have bad left ventricle, so low in dronetarone too. Now, this one is quite a while, the paper from China. So these are people who had persistent AFib for more than a month, but, but the age is less than 70 and the left atrial size is less than seven centimeters. Uh, the long-term follow-up uh, with amiodarone and cardioversion, it turned out that people, about 40% uh, remain in sinus rhythm over a year follow-up. Now, this data from Amit Vora, our friend, uh, a craft trial, different craft uh, from India, uh, 140 something patients. Again, atrial size are not too big. The duration AFib was only six years only. Uh, and Almost everyone had valve intervention. In group one, where they actually uh, give them their own or placebo and try to keep people in normal rhythm, uh, about half can maintain normal rhythm at one year. Now, over time, over time, the number of people maintaining sinus rhythm kind of goes down a little bit, but you know, still be in the range of 50%. Now, in this group of patients that can maintain, can be maintained in normal rhythm. So I guess it's echo uh, Professor Goet's uh, talk and uh, Dr. Park's talk, that being in normal rhythm is good. So, so exercise time, New York Heart Association, even mortality rate is, is less, but there's little, there's a few patients, so it's hard to say that it's significant, but it does. Um, another study from China, Again, these are patients who, again, uh, less than 12 months uh, of AFib, uh, atrial size was less than uh, 4.5 centimeters. And by just giving, uh, just doing uh, microvaviloplasty uh, treated with cotarone, uh, patients can maintain uh, sinus rhythm, uh, you know, almost like 100% uh, at one year. I think I hit the wrong button. Okay, let's get that. There, one moment. Oops. So again, in this study, in this study, once you do the rate control, the quality of life improved and the six minute walk also better with rhythm control, which resulted in most people staying in normal rhythm. Uh, this one, uh, data from, um, my colleague uh, across the river in Bangkok, Sibirat Hospital. Dr. wrote, uh, after one month after balloon valvuloplasty, they do cardioversion, which is successful in 70% of the patients, giving the amiodarone on the day of valvuloplasty. Uh, and, and about two thirds of the patient remains in normal rhythm uh, at one year. And then the, the Atrial, I usually, the rhythm results are better if the atriums are less than uh, six centimeters, especially better with not having associated aortic valve or heart disease. Again, another paper from India. So after PTMC, only or PTMC plus cardioversion, you could see that doing a cardioversion after the PMC with treatment with uh, amiodarone result in better control of sinus rhythm. Certainly, yes, again, echoing previous talk, being in normal rhythm and a better quality of life. Another study uh, from India again, about 51% of patients uh, has um, 
maintain normal rhythm at one year. Now, in this group of patients, again from India, from uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, my multiple stenosis, so now these are without uh, valve, uh, valvuloplasty, uh, just giving uh, flecainide. A group of patients after a loading dose of flecainide, a two out of 50 turns into normal sinus rhythm, and the rest will need cardioversion. 36 maintain sinus rhythm, and the other one are not successful uh, regard, regardless of the medication. The, the maintain, maintenance rate is good at 60% at one year, so uh, relatively good. Now, talking about ablation, I guess uh, our friend Mohan Nair started uh, chalking the patient back to normal rhythm and induce a rhythm where two sites were favorite uh, ablation site was osteo of coronary, uh, coronary sinus os and the septal side. Uh, doing ablation, they actually keep uh, most people in normal rhythm. The, on that particular paper, it was a long standing AFib. Looking at the electrogram in the primary vein, in all his patients were non existent. So maybe a longer patient with more severe disease. Uh, and Drago also reported doing PVI uh, with uh, valvuloplasty and keep 60% of the patient in normal sinus rhythm at five years. Uh, Professor Narasimhan also uh, reported uh, that in his few cases of patient, there's some triggers coming from the PVs and from the backside of the atrium. Uh, not too many cases. Uh, a hybrid ablation with mitrovaviloplasty. Uh, so yes, doing ablation and valvuloplasty also help maintaining uh, sinus rhythm as compared to just doing balloon and just chalk the patient back to normal rhythm. And another uh, study from Dr. Chen though, uh, people with mild muscle strenosis, doing ablation in this group of patients, the results are not as good as people without rheumatic heart disease. Now this one uh, from Professor Park, this one a little more extensive, it's including uh, post-surgery and, and uh, prosthetic valve and repairs and things like that. Now in this group of patients though, Professor Park showed that at 70 months, the results are not bad. Uh, they're quite similar between the people having valvular heart disease and non-valvular heart disease. So comparable result. Now, surgery is probably one of the things that uh, mostly talked about. Uh, when you do a, a rheumatic heart disease and do ablation surgically uh, in combination with it, uh, the result, this one they said had only 10% recurrent uh, during follow-up. Uh, this one showing the group that actually doing cryoablation, not cryoballoon, but cryoablation of the atrium in combination with WAP surgery end up with a better control of rhythm during follow-ups. Again, this one showing same way uh, for four years follow-up doing a irrigated ablation during surgery compared to the group that having ablation later. So do surgery today, follow up a few months and do ablation then as compared to go ahead and do empirical ablation by the surgeon. Uh, the group that has uh, intraoperative uh, ablation have the freedom of ATAF better. Now, these are overall, the mortality rate are not different, but surgical ablation tend to be able to hold sinus rhythm better than control. Now, these were indication uh, cited by Professor Nita. Uh, so chronic AF with rheumatic heart, if the patient's undergoing valve repair or bioprosthetic valve, it's probably a good idea to think about doing AF surgery with it. Uh, all patients going for AF surgery for some valve surgery can, especially, I guess it's up to the surgeon, if they can do the extra work without adding too much risk for the patient. There'll be a something. So um, summary, don't forget uh, stroke prevention and rate control are similar in people with rheumatic uh, heart disease or valvular heart disease to non valve And rhythm control, it's achievable by you know, fixing the valve 
giving antiarrhythmic drugs, catheter-based surgery, a combination of all these things. The results are debatable. Uh, these were editorial by uh, Professor Brugada. Now, if you remember these, the more AFib you have, the more pathology you have, type progression of AFib. Rheumatic heart disease are probably on this side of the spectrum with more uh, scar and all these fibrosis in the heart. So potentially less likely that the rhythm control will be successful. And with that, I think that's the end of my talk. Oh, there's some suggestion, but I'll skip that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tachapong. Thank I think as, as in the previous uh, format, we will leave the discussion to the end. Yes. Next is my pleasure to introduce Professor Takanori Ikeda, who is the Professor and Chairman at Toho University Faculty of Medicine. He is also the President-Elect of the International Society for Holter and Non-Invasive Electrocardiology. Today, he's going to talk a very uh, important uh, topic because we see a lot more heart failure patients. His topic is on rhythm or rate control strategy for non-valvular atrial fibrillation therapy in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction after castle AF. Professor Takanori, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Theo and uh, Professor Ari. Also, thank you very much for inviting me. So from now on, I will talk about rhythm or rate control strategy for non barbara AF, focusing on AF with concomitant HFLF. Actually, uh, you know, there are some overlaps with the uh, previous uh, speakers. From point of my view, I will have a presentation on this topic. This one shows uh, my COA disclosures. First of all, I would like to mention about general treatment flow of AF. Initially, we will do a lifestyle changes and a treatment of underlying cardiovascular conditions. Then I will do a pharmacotherapy. If pharmacotherapy is failed, we will consider catheter ablation. If patient cannot take anticoagulant, also we will consider left atrial appendage closure devices. As I show in the slide, when the flow goes down, invasiveness is increased, but certainty increased. Always we have to think about balance between satisfaction of patient and healthcare cost. So initially, we, I would like to mention about the current status of cashita ablation in my country. This one shows the number of our patients receiving cashita ablation in Japan. This report is derived from JCS, J Log Registries. Look at the, uh, these uh, curves. In Japan, number of our patients who underwent cashita ablation is uh, rapidly increasing. At this year, 2021, the number is estimated as more than 120 cases. Japanese current population is 125 million. So that means that 0.1% people are receiving cassita ablation annually. That's a big number. This one shows a cassita ablation procedure for AF in my institute. High volume center, such as my institute. We have a three mapping system, such as Carlton, Insight, Navix, or Rhythmia. We have uh, all of them. And also we have an uh, ablation catheter, including a uh, cryo balloon, hot balloon, and also laser balloon and so forth. In Japan, basically EP specialists certified from the JHRS are doing catheter ablation. Currently, 1,050 cardiologists are certified as a EP specialist. Total number of uh, JHRS is 10,200. That means that 10% 10, 10 of the member are certified as an EP specialist. These guys are doing a cassette ablation in my countries. This one shows a JCS. JCS means the Japanese Circulation Society Guidelines for AF cassette ablations. Unfortunately, this guideline is written in Japanese, so I translated it. This is a 
except of the section of indication of casita aberrations, symptomatic and paroxysmal AF. Casita aberration is recommended as class 2A. Persistent AF, casita aberration is class 2A, but long persistent AF, that is a casita aberration is classified as class 2B. So look at the, uh, this one. When we fail the anti-arrhythmic drug therapy, casita aberration is recommended as class one. So look at the, uh, these uh, recommendations. AF casita aberration may be reasonable as a first-line treatment in symptomatic and paroxysmal AF patient without airway enlargement and the airway, uh, airway dysfunctions. If patient satisfies with uh, these category criteria, we can do a casita ablation as a first line. So that's why the number of uh, you know, casita ablation in Japan rapidly increasing. So let's move on the pharmacotherapies. There are four types of uh, pharmacotherapies. The first, anticoagulation therapy, including the DOAC and the warfarin. And the uh, rhythm control therapy, mainly including the class one and the class three anti-arrhythmic drugs. And the late control therapy, including the beta vocal, calcium antagonists, and the dejoxin. And fourth, upstream therapies. Unfortunately, currently, upstream therapy is out of the topics. I will not show a previous guideline of pharmacotherapy. This is a previous one. When we detected the AF, definitely, First step is the anticoagulation therapy. But second step, rhythm control therapy and rate of control therapy are equally recommended. This is a previous guideline. This one shows the current guidelines. Definitely first step, that is the anticoagulation therapy. But look at the uh, second step and the third step. Rate of control therapy is recommended before rhythm control therapy. Now we have a question. Why the sequence changes? The reason is because numerous clinical evidences, including the following study were published, rhythm control therapy versus rate control therapy. As you know, a firm race, these studies demonstrated that no difference exists between the rhythm control therapy and the rate control therapy in terms of all cost mortality and cardiovascular event in elderly AF patient or in patient after cardioversion. After that, these study also published AF, CHF, and the JRIS. I would like to show a brief data, these HF and the JRIS. This one shows the AHCF trials. Rhythm control versus rate control therapy in AF patient with Concomitant heart failures. In rhythm control therapies, amiodarone was used. In the rate control therapies, beta vodka and the dejoxin was used. As in the uh, show in the slide, death from cardiovascular cause, death from any cause, stroke, worsening heart failure, and the composite outcomes. This trial demonstrated that no difference exists between two therapies. This one shows the j rhythm trial, which is performed in Japan. So look at the uh, right panel, persistent AF. Rate control is uh, better than rhythm control significantly. Look at the uh, paroxysmal AF. Looks like uh, rhythm control seems to be better than rate control. But in this study, primary event, aggravation of QRS also included. This is a soft event. When we excluded uh, this soft event, that means a hard event, no difference. So that means that this trial also showed similar outcome with those in Western countries. So this data also uh, Professor Grete demonstrated, so I will skip. So current status for pharmacotherapy in AF. Although outcome of East AFNET 4 trial were reported, the current consensus is that rate control is equal or superior to rhythm control therapy when pharmacotherapy was performed in all AF patients 
including a long persistent or permanent AF, like that. Further rate control therapy of AF, beta blocker, digoxin, or non dehydropyrrhine calcium antagonists have been used in clinical trial, namely rate control drugs. Which is the most common drugs for rate control among the beta blocker, digoxin, and the calcium antagonists? To answer the, this question, I would like to show a couple of data. So initially, Canadian density, namely CARF. Look at the, uh, these uh, curves. Long time ago, digoxin was mainly used for rate control. But the recent years, beta broker have been used mainly. Similarly, look at the, uh, this one, Japanese resin, same story. Main drug is uh, beta broker. So for rate control therapy of AF, the incidence of beta blocker gradually increased compared to digoxin and the calcium antagonist. Why did beta blocker become main drug was the rate control? So I would like to show a couple of data to support uh, this idea. Initially, this one, beta blocker versus digoxin for rate control therapy. Assessment of prognosis in AF patient with concomitant heart failures. Left panel shows a half -ref. This one shows a half -ref. Look at the uh, upper panel. Use of the beta blocker improved prognosis of uh, AF patient. In contrast, look at the uh, dejection. Use of a uh, dejection has uh, such an effect. This is the first story. And then second story. Calcium antagonist versus placebo for a rate control therapy. Assessment of progression of heart failure in post MI patient with reduced EF, MDP. Calcium antagonist, Gilchiazem versus placebo. As shown in the slide, Gilchiazem was than placebo. If we attempted a Gilchiazem in reduced cardiac function, so that means that we cannot use calcium antagonists in a patient with cardiac dysfunction. So we will show this data, recent clinical study using a beta blocker in Japan. For a rent control therapy using a beta blocker in AF patients, several clinical trials were recently performed in Japan because the main beta blocker, such as the Bisopro, and uh, coverage law were not covered by insurance until uh, 2012. That's a problem. So we did uh, this kind of a study. First, the uh, main AF for use of a bisoprolol tablet in AF patient. And the second, AF coverage law for use of a coverage law tablet in AF patient. As you know, bisoprolol and coverage law have been used worldwide. Additionally, we did a DISE study, JRAND and the Bisono area. JRAND, that's uh, for use of uh, intravenous Langeolol in AF and uh, HFP patients. Langeolol is a super high selective beta 1 blockers, and uh, this actually is a uh, very rapid. So, this is very useful, acute phase of uh, rapid AF. And also, Bisono AF, this is uh, for uh, use of bisoprolol patch in AF patient. Patch means uh, like a very, very thin tape just put on the chest. That is effective. That is a very you know, nice for an elderly AF patient. So we did a DISA study. So now evidence of the beta blocker were constructed as a rate control therapy in Japanese AF patients. So now we have uh, another question for a rhythm control therapy in AF. For a rhythm control therapy in paroxysmal or a persistent AF patient, we can select not only antiarrhythmic drugs, but also catheter ablation, like that. Which is a better antiarrhythmic drug or a catheter ablation in AF patient, particularly a patient with concomitant half -rep. To answer the, this question, I would like to show uh, some data. First, this data, 
anti-arrhythmic drugs versus uh, cassette ablation. Wilbur and uh, Karskis did a meta-analysis. This systematic review indicated that as second line treatment, second line treatment for a parasitic AM, cassette ablation is more effective than anti-arrhythmic drug therapy. This is the first step. And the second step, this one, mantra path and the left tube as not second, as first line treatment for a paroxysmal AF, cassette ablation compared with the anti-arrhythmic drugs result in a lower rate of big current AF. This is the second step. And the third step, this SARA study, in patient with persistent AF, this trial demonstrated lower recurrence rate after cassette ablation compared with anti-arrhythmic drug therapy. And fourth step, this one, ATAC. In patient with persistent AF and concomitant HFREF, cassette ablation is superior to anti-arrhythmic drug therapy using amiodarone. This is the first report in the patient with AF and concomitant HFREF. And then this paper published. This one is uh, not anti-arrhythmic drugs. This one shows a uh, late control drugs versus cassette ablation, namely camera MRI. In patient with AF and left ventricular systolic dysfunction, cassette ablation for AF improved uh, cardiac function compared with the uh, medical late control champions. To follow the these study, this study is published. That's a CASL AF. Cassita ablation for patient with AF and HFL was associated with a lower rate of composite end point or mortality of hospitalization for worsening heart failure than medical therapy, including either rhythm or rate control drugs. This one included both rhythm control drugs and the rate control drugs. And then this one published. Actually, uh, already uh, Professor Park showed uh, this data. I will skip. According to uh, this outcome, guideline was revised. This one shows the uh, European guidelines. This one shows the uh, excerpt of the section of atrial fibrillation cassette ablation in symptomatic and uh, paroxysmal or persistent AF. And HFREF, look at the, uh, this one. Cassette ablation is recommended as class one. But uh, this one shows the uh, addenda. The statement is that recommendation to reserve LV dysfunction when tachycardiomyopathy uh, is highly probable. So I think this guideline is not applied for all atrial fibrillation, all these are fibrillation, I think. The second, I would like to show the American guidelines. Statement is much different from European guidelines. This one shows a section of cassette ablation in patient with AF and HFF. Statement is that AF cassette ablation may be reasonable in selected patient with symptomatic AF and HFF to potentially lower mortality rate and reduce hospitalization or HF. They decided this kind of a patient, class 2B. Two randomized clinical trials, ATAC and CASRA, have limitation because uh, they included relatively small and highly selected patient population. As you know, number of patients each group, just uh, 150. That's not, much, not so many. So they said it. Further larger study are needed to validate such a result. This is American guideline. I would like to show a Japanese guideline. I'm sorry, this is written in Japanese, but the Chinese and the Singaporean, the Taiwanese people can read this guideline. So the section of cassette ablation for AF complicating HF. Recommendation is that AF cassette ablation may be applied in symptomatic patient, regardless of the presence of heart failure. Recommendation is 
class to men. So in each guidelines, recommendation of a uh, class of a cassette ablation for patient with the AF and the HFLF varies from a class one to a class two. That's very, very interesting for me. Finally, I would like to show this data. This is a very interesting because, uh, you know, Dr. Professor Gate also mentioned about uh, this kind of, uh, you know, outcomes. Effect of a cassita ablation with versus result continued anti arrhythmic drugs. Powder AF. Continued use of previously effective anti arrhythmic drug significantly reduced recurrence of symptomatic paroxysmal AF. Hybrid rhythm control therapy might be effective strategy. I think, I think that this idea is a very, very useful clinical practice. So let me conclude my presentation. Current status of rhythm control therapy using anti-arrhythmic drugs, EAF, is for symptomatic patient as a next step of bed control therapy, regardless of cardiac function. In terms of rhythm control therapy, Cassette ablation more effective in restoring and maintaining sinus relief compared with anti arrhythmic drug therapy in AF patients. However, it is three still unclear regarding the improvement of prognosis and inhibition of cardiovascular events in AF patients with concomitant heifer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Ikida for that uh, very um, extensive uh, coverage on the treatment of uh, AF in Japan. We will have the discussion at the end. So finally, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Xie Ming Xiong, and he is a professor of medicine at the uh, Taipei Medical University from Taipei, Taiwan. Um, he's an old friend of mine. And uh, he's going to talk about rhythm or rate control strategy for non-valvular atrial fibrillation in heart failure with preserved EF after Athena. This is an important topic because uh, heart failure, uh, H half path is actually getting more and more common. And it's interesting to see how whether ablation will help to control this group of patients. Professor, say please. Thanks, Dr. Thiel, for your kind introduction. Today, I'm Dr. Xie Minxiong from Taipei, Taiwan. Today, my talk of my talk is reading or control strategy for lumbar valve AF therapy in heart path at Asena. As we know, Asena trial is an international RCT that during that long could significantly reduce the CB hospitalization or death in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or flutter when compared with placebo. However, after the Andromeda and the PALS trial, Zorindalong is contraindicated for heart failure and the permanent air patient. After Asina trial, we do not have new oral anti arrhythmia drug for renal control of air. Therefore, how do we treat air patient with heart pain? anti arrhythmic ablation or rate control. Today, my talk will include three parts. First, the epidemiology of AF in HAPEF. Second, rate control strategy in AF with HAPEF. Third, and the major part, region control strategy in AF with HAPEF. The first one I will discuss the epidemiology of AF in HAPEF. There are several overlapping symptoms of F and the heart pain, including shortness of breath, impaired exercise tolerance, fatigue, and the dizziness. And both of them share some similar mechanisms, such as myocardial inflammation and the fibrosis, LA dilatation and the EP remodeling to develop F and the heart pain. In Sweden, Swedish heart failure registry from 2000 to 2012. The prevalence of F decreased with decreasing EF. 
half pave 65 percent, half value middle range 60 percent, and the half rev 53 percent. But in all three EF group, the prevalence of F increased with age. Using the NIS database, the prevalence of F in half pave increased from 37.5% in 2008 to 44.7% in 2012. The trend of air prevalence was similar in air with half ref and the half pef. In addition, the prevalence of air is higher in half pef than patient with half ref. This slide shows the prevalence of F in major half value registry and highlights the consistently higher prevalence of F in half pef when compared with half rep. The prevalence of F in half pef is around 32% to 65%. This slide shows the Asian half value study. The prevalence of F in Asia is about 29% in half pef, higher than 80% in half rep. This study also showed the prevalence of F in Asia has regional differences. Lower in South Asia and the higher in Northeast and the Southeast Asia. Also lower prevalence in Indian and the higher air prevalence in Japan and Korea. In addition, the prevent F increase the all cause mortality between 11% to 37% in patient with heart pain. This slide shows the outcome of F in heart pain versus heart rate. This meta-analysis study shows all-cause mortality is significantly higher in patients with AF heart rate than patients with AF heart pain. And the stock and the heart failure hospitalization was similar between the two groups. The second part, I would like to talk about the rate control strategy of AF in heart pain. This slide shows a meta-analysis study, including 11 RCTs, to investigate the effects of beta blocker on the cardiovascular outcome in patients with heart value, both in sinus fusion or atrial fibrillation. The results show beta blocker could significantly reduce all-cause mortality, cardiovascular deaths, and the cardiovascular hospitalization in patients with heart rate in sinus region. However, we could not see the beneficial effect of beta block in patients with heart pain, both in sinus region or atrial fibrillation. For the change of LVEF, beta block could only improve in a patient with severe LV systolic dysfunction, LVEF less than 25%. But no improvement or even worse of LVEF in a patient with heart pain. For rate control strategy, if the medication fails, amino operation plus patient is another choice. This ratio amino operation plus his patient may significantly improve LV and thyroid dimension and the LVEF in patient with heart rate, but only mild improvement of LVEF in patient with heart pain. The third part and the major part, I will discuss the reason control strategy in patient with heart pain, with have air with heart pain. Focus on case operation. Reason control strategy, especially case operation of F, is recommended for patients with heart rate in the current guideline that the previous speaker has emphasized. How about the strategy for a patient in heart pain? Currently, there are no RCTs available to compare the efficacy of reason control versus rate control 
in the F HPEP population. Only observation study investigating the efficacy of cluster abrasion in F HPEP have been published. This slide shows the gap with the guideline half value registry from 2008 to 2014, included more than 15,000 air patients with heart pain, age 65 years and older. Only 12% of patients underwent reason control, and they have better one-year survival, 69.2% then those with rate control, 62.5%. About 85% of reason control strategy use anti arrhythmia drug, and most of them are amiodarone. And 89% uh, of rate control strategy use the beta block. In the following slide, I will focus on case operation of F in half -pep. This study from Japan group including 74% 74 heart pain patients underwent cluster operation of F during the mean follow-up 34 months. 27% of patients remain F. The results are not so bad, especially 59% of patients are long-standing persistent F. This study also found Japan group included 85 heart patients. 60% of them are non-persistent AF. The FAT recurrence rate was similar between the operation and the lung operation group during the long-term follow-up. The operation group could significantly reduce the instance of heart failure or all costs with hospitalization during the long-term follow-up when compared with the lung operation group. In addition, the patient remained in such region also had a low instance of heart failure with hospitalization. How about the operation effect on air patient with different ejection fraction? This slide shows one year efficacy after case air operation. The air pandemic nation rate or control rate was similar between heart rate and the heart path. However, the air patient with normal EF had a better air admission rate and the control rate when compared with heart rate. During the long-term follow-up of five years, the arrhythmia free rate was similar between heart path 40% and the heart rate 33%, but was significantly lower than those with normal EF. However, the baseline patient characteristics were quite different between three groups. If heart rate patient had more male patient and the less paracetamol age physician type, and the F with heart rate, heart path patient were older. The procedure related complication were similar between the three group. This study from the United States included 238 heart failure patients who underwent cancer operation. The one year freedom from ATF was similar between F heart path and the F heart rate patient. The procedure related to the adverse event and the all cause hospitalization and the cardiovascular hospitalization were similar between the two groups. After cancer operation, both half age group had a significant improvement of NYHA functional class. Another study from Japan also demonstrated the long term freedom from AP and the AP after cluster operation was similar between heart rate and the heart pep. The freedom from heart failure hospitalization was also similar between heart rate and the heart pep patient. 
just uh, the previous study in the United States, most half age groups had a significant improvement in NYHA functional class after case operation of AF. A new study published in AJC 2020, they included 547 AF patient underwent case operation. The recurrence of AF flutter AT on or of AD was similar between AF no F no half value, F half rate and F half pay patient. The recurrence of F flutter AT of AD was significantly higher in F with half pay when compared with F no half value patient. The rate of uh, all cause hospitalization was significantly lower in F no half value patient when compared with the other two half value group. The rate of all cause mortality was similar between three groups. This study further investigated the case operation effect in different types of F. In patients with persistent F, the recurrence of F on or of AD was significantly higher in F half path than in F with half rate. But the recurrence of in but the recurrence in patients with persistent AG preparation epidural operation was similar between three groups. In this year, a meta-analysis of F operation in half path published in AJC. The risk of recurrent HV fibrillation one year after case operation was similar between patients with heart path and the heart rate. The fluoroscopy time was significantly shorter in patients with heart path than patients with heart rate. The procedure time and the, the peri procedure adverse event was similar between the two groups. The hospitalization was similar between the two groups, but the mortality was significantly lower in patients with heart pain than patients with heart rate. Finally, I will talk about the guideline recommendation. The 2019 HACC HIS focus update AIP guideline. They suggest F case operation may be reasonable in some in select patients with symptomatic F and the heart rate to low mortality and mortality rate and the reduce of hospitalization. This is a class 2B evidence. This guideline did not mention case operation in heart rate with heart path. The ESC 2020 AF guideline, guideline has some recommendation for ray control or region control strategy in patients with heart pain. For ray control strategy, they suggest pharmacological ray control strategy are different for patients with heart pain and the heart rate. Beta blocker, deuterium, rapamil, and the digoxin are all viable op options in heart pain. And the amygdalone may be considered for ray control in most form of heart failure, but only in the acute setting. Amino operation and the patient can control ventricular rate when medication fails. For region control of air with heart path, in an operation study, region control strategies showed a low one year all cause death over rate control in older patients aged 65 years and older with heart path. If case operation has been shown to improve symptom, exercise capacity, quality of life, and the LVEF in a patient with heart failure. However, they did not mention case operation F, a case operation of F with heart pain. They only mentioned just uh, F, case operation in F with the heart rate. The evidence was 2A a little different with American guideline. This is my telephone message. 
the prevalence of AF was higher in patients with heart PEP than heart rate. Beta block is the most common rate control drug for AF with heart PEP. Reason control strategy may be better than rate control for AF with heart PEP. The efficacy and the safety of AF catheter operation are similar between heart PEP and the heart rate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Xie. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for keeping on time. And so we have a little bit of time for discussion. <coughs> Perhaps I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Pong. Uh, you know, going through your, when you were talking about rheumatic heart disease and how it is really not easy to treat these patients when they are uh, already having established rheumatic heart disease. Is, isn't it much more easier if we just prevent rheumatic heart disease? Like now, I hardly see any rheumatic heart disease. <laughs> There's no rheumatic heart disease for me to ablate. So I, I, I think your talk highlights to me, you know, but when I have a patient with established rheumatic stenosis, I, I don't even bother to try. I, I don't know about you. I think I had done a case maybe 20 years ago and then I go in and map just like you said we were doing cafe so it was like no nowhere to ablate it's like no it's like no there's no tissue to ablate all all scar and like tiny cafe and like okay it's the end of the day we don't do this <laughs> and since then I have not done it again <laughs> do, do any of the papers have long-term results like 10 years you know, results of... No, the, 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 the papers are quite rare. I was digging through it and then, you know, most of them only report one year. I'm sure over time, it <laughs> all goes into AFib. Just like the x-ray I show on the first slide, it's that big, hard, <laughs> rheumatic post-surgery. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Professor Lin, are you seeing a lot more rheumatic heart disease in Taiwan? Uh, that's when I was uh, registered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, when I was arrested, the whole uh, cardiology war is full of my heart disease. Yes. But, uh, I cannot really, even hear like opening snap now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm interested in that uh, the uh, amyodarone seems to be still quite effective after the uh, cardioversion of the AP in the body heart or after the, uh, after the uh, PDMC. My commissurotomy. So, how do you think about? I don't know. Uh, how about the, the, the uh, experience in Thailand? Is it that uh, you uh, you were trying to convert it to sinus as much as you could, or you just want to very control it with anticoagulant? I don't know that touch upon it. How do you feel about that? Uh, this feel yeah, sometimes we this kind of, but it's difficult for us to make decision. I think I think most of the time, I think uh, just like the guidelines, if I see mild mitral stenosis or moderate mitral stenosis, and and if they happens to have a fib, I kind of try to send them to my friend to try to do the bavaloplasty rather than trying to do rhythm control. I have not, I have not done it uh, trying to do ablate people with with uh, mitral stenosis or severe MR. Doctor Park has done a lot of work on this thing, Doc Professor Park. <laughs> What you say? <laughs> you have the wow. Uh, I, I, so I, also have a, <laughs> I also have a limited experience for the the mitral AP population, but uh, I don't see the rheumatic AP uh, nowadays. But uh, uh, thank you very much to introduce my paper. But uh, that paper includes a definite selection bias. Mean left atrial size was uh, about forty-eight millimeter. So. Uh, in the selective patients, the, the valvular mitral AP also can be controlled by catheter ablation, but the most of patients shows atrial tachycardia, not the atrial fibrillation, because <clears> the, <throat> even though atrial size is big, but the, there is a small the muscle mass. So critical mass was small, so there is a, no room for the wave break of atrial fibrillation. So sometimes if the, the lot of scar, it is... Uh, several touch of ablation terminated tachycardia, but the next problem is sinus node dysfunction. <laughs> next, <laughs> yeah. next, I'd like to ask Professor Ikeda, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the 
AF uh, with heart failure reduce EF patients. Uh, do you think that some of these, like you mentioned, alluded to, some of the studies are a little bit biased in the sense that the patients were highly selected. These were patients who likely have atrial fibrillation with tachycardia cardiomyopathy, which you and I do see. You know, they have rapid heart rates, uh, even though their average may not be very high, but intermittently they have very high heart rates. So they're likely to have uh, AF-induced uh, tachycardia cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. I am. Is this still relevant? Has my point earlier on to Andreas in the patient whose primary presentation is dilated ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. and atrial fibrillation? Do I always have difficulty? Will I try <laughs> in this group? You know, <laughs> EF is so huge, atrium so huge, heart failure. <laughs> I usually shy away now. Uh -huh. Hey, I, I agree with you. There's such an idea, you know, AF, including all of them. But previously, you know, that's a you know, study is uh, impossible. But we, then we focus on the cardio, you know, tachy, car, uh, cardiomyopathies. That is very effective. So yes. we have to distinguish all of them, you know, such a, you know, individual etiology. The story will be different. I agree. <laughs> Maybe Andreas can tell us how much of the early AF patients presented with. Uh, is tachycardia cardiomyopathy or, 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 or uh, bad cardiomyopathy or this really quite new young patients? Uh, actually, yeah, yeah. In my impression is that uh, within a couple of months, that's mean yes. two or three months, that's, that's mean, you know, calcium ablation could be effective. But uh, more than three or four months, that's a uh, very difficult, difficult. To, yeah, to restore the uh, atrial fibrillation, sinus rhythm. What about uh, Dr. Gotter? What about in the in your East uh, AF trial? Were there a lot of tachycardia cardiomyopathy patients? Gotta. Well, um, so far we, we just have the baseline characteristics, so um, we can actually make statements about the baseline um, ejector fraction. So we we do not have follow up. Uh, in that sense that I can really say well how the um, uh, ejection fraction behaved during follow up. But I think sometimes it's, it's uh, if someone comes in with a very rapid heart rate, then of course you can assume that the tachycardia induced myopathy. However, of course, many patients have an established cardiomyopathy and then develop atrial fibrillation afterwards. And if the left atrium is heavily enlarged, then of course um, it might be that the cardiomyopathy is a predominant factor. But um, one aspect I'd like to point out is, uh, and that is something like called a functional atrial mitral regurgitation. And this is something which is uh, very heavily um, associated with severe pulmonary congestion. And uh, especially if you have a heavily dilated left atrium, you may have an impact of the leaflet motion, and then you have malcoaptation and uh, mitral regurgitation. So this is something probably we may also keep in mind that uh, restoration of rhythm and probably also altering the geometry of the atria may affect uh, mitral regurgitation and also then symptoms of, um, uh, of, of uh, heart failure um, because many patients really have extraordinary symptoms, but ejection fraction is just in the mid range and you do not know why, why do they have so much uh, complaints, but sometimes it's really the mitral valve and then it, uh, uh, restoration of sinus rhythm really may help in these patients. Yes, that, that, that will be a challenging group. The, the Professor Xie, I mean, the, you, you talked about heart failure preserve EF is uh, interesting, but uh, even in the heart failure category, they have not uh, defined heart failure preserve EF. Uh, it, it seems to me that it's still a mixed bag of disease, not a single disease. Very hard for us to be. The etiology of the disease seems to be the most important. There's no good drugs. Uh, I mean, what, what is the role, do you think, of heart of ablation as first line? I, I think uh, just uh, uh, Dr. mentioned, uh, heart failure is a diverse disease, uh, uh, diverse cause. So it's 
uh, difficult to make a decision to to case separation or region control or maybe rate control. Uh, for me, uh, a younger half field patient, even half pep or half rep, I will uh, more aggressive uh, region control. Uh, for me, uh, I think for half pep patient, I will do more uh, operation strategy. Maybe then hardware because uh, the uh, just the paper published mentioned the mortality rate is higher in hardware. So I think if the patient condition is suitable for case operation, I think uh, for hard patient, I will recommend more aggressive region control even case operation. Thank, thank you. I, I think this has been a very interesting uh, uh, seminar. I think, uh, I, to me, I think one of the most important thing, and this was brought on by Professor Gotter, is that the earlier we treat these patients, whether it is ablation, whether it is rhythm control, whether it's drugs, and unfortunately we don't have time, whether it is risk factor management. I, I find that in my own practice, I emphasize to the patient that risk factor management, uh, alcohol abstinence and everything is so important. There's no point I do an ablation and you go and trigger it. So I think, but, but I think what is important and for us as the EP community is we need to tell our fellow cardiologists that it is not right to just say, okay, it's all right to have atrial fibrillation. We just rate control and anticoagulate. It's actually second best. We have a lot of data uh, that it is useful, except that I think too many times it is too late and uh, we get it too late and the patients come to us too late. They have too many comorbidities and whatever we do, that's why the long-term success rate is not good. So every the other non-interventionalists will say, yeah, it's hopeless. No point in doing ablation. Patient will just come back. So I think that at least now I tell my patients, Ablation is only part of the therapy. Selected patients, it will help to keep them in sinus rhythm. And maybe, you know, with other treatment, we can keep them out of trouble. Well, that's my take on this. Maybe Professor Lin, you have any other comments or any of the other speakers? Yes, I uh, only come out with uh, one short question. It seems <laughs> the uh, cast ablation is... Uh, not so effective for those patients of uh, more than 75 years or more obese, and even with, with, with more metabolic syndrome. But it seems to me that the, uh, from the EastNet, EastMNET study, it seems that the, uh, there is no difference in these subgroups. I'm just wondering why is the difference? Because uh, uh, for hep hep, they are also the group with uh, more metabolic syndrome, obesity, all these, uh, all these problems. And I just want to maybe Dr. Gode or Dr. Park or Dr. She, you want to say if it's uh, still better to maintain sinus rhythm, maybe just by better anterior anti drugs, or you will still recommend test separation for these patients, age patients, and uh, with metabolic syndrome, obesity. How, how do you feel about that? I just say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm really puzzled that he, uh, how I'm going, I'm going to suggest to my patients. For my clinical practice, uh, for younger patients, maybe age less than 65 years old, I will uh, recommend more aggressive breathing control strategy for Hard or hard rep patient, I will, dis, uh, will do self decision making of case operation with the patient. If the patient can accept the electrocardiogram case operation, I will uh, recommend the pa uh, younger patient to receive a grace rhythm control. For the obesity patient, is a uh, big problem for even electrical cardiogram. I have one uh, very obese patient. Uh, we I do electrical calibration, but fail. Two obesity, and uh, the other 
on the other hand, the uh, obese patient uh, who underwent catheter ablation, the effect is something worse. So for obesity patient, it's quite difficult to make a decision to do uh, region control or weight control. But for me, I will recommend more aggressive for younger patient, even in obese patient. I think uh, body weight loss, body weight reduce is very important for such kind of patient. But we uh, time is uh, time is important. So I I I also recommend to early reason control. How about Dr. Gordon? How do you feel about that? Do you want to well, suggest us the uh, use of uh, good anti-rich drugs for cancer based on these uh, difficult patients? Well, I, I think probably both. And, uh, but on the other hand, there is one concept, especially in HEFPEF, we may at least uh, consider, and that is the transeptal puncture. Because we do know that there are intraatrial shunt devices, if you haven't pressure overload in the left ventricle, left atrium. And especially in elderly patients, if you do a transeptal puncture and probably the shunt remains open for a while, you also may have a decrease in, in symptoms uh, just by having the transeptal puncture done. So um, this could be an interesting component, in particular in, in the elderly, where you would also consider if uh, the vet pressure is above 15 or so, um, really to have such a device implanted. Um, so I think um, it, it's really a combination. And, and so for that reason, I feel quite happy because the majority of patients in the world with atrial fibrillation are treated with medical therapy. So not everybody in the world with AF has the chance to get ablated. Uh, although we, we do many ablations a day, it's, it's way few to, it's, it's way too, many, too, too low the number um, than to treat everybody. So it's really a mixture. And for that reason, I think now we have everything. It's not about ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs. It's a combination and we have to be realistic um, how to treat everybody. And many patients are there. They are very afraid having a procedure done on one hand side and there are others being afraid of antiarrhythmic drugs. And now we have actually the whole portfolio to deal with all the different uh, aspects of rhythm control. And like uh, Dr. Theo already said, Sinus rhythm is good, and I think this is now a very good message. And you can use whatever you have available to treat your patients. I think we need to detect the atrial fibrillation early. And your point about the machine learning is interesting. The wearables are going to be interesting. If we catch them early and treat them and prevent them from going into the cardiomyopathy, which you have described as so elegantly, then I think we will have a good chance. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure we can go on discussing uh, more and more, but I think we're a little bit over time. Uh, I must thank all the speakers uh, and, of course, my co-chair, Professor Lin. Uh, any comments from Adam, anyone else? If not, I think we need to close. But I would like to thank everyone for the very good talks and, of course, the excellent discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.